And so, my little life journey began. You know, I had, a, I had a good home. I had a good mom and dad. My mom was a secretary at Redland Baptist Church ever since I was in elementary school. So I have nothing in my past to show you of why I became what I became. Did you know that music stimulates your mind more than sex? Do you know you can listen to one song and it changes your entire mood? How many of y'all have one song that you always go to if you're down? You have one song that you play to lift you back up. Music is like a drug, okay? It stimulates you. You know, growing up, I was an 80s kid. Any 80s kids out there? What began to happen in my life is the enemy watches you. There's, he has no time limit. He sits there and he watches you and he sees what you like. He sees what you're interested in. And from a very young age, I can remember in seventh and eighth grade, growing up, the metal scene always just en enticed me. Uh, growing up, you had Dio, you had Motley Crue, you had Ozzy, you had all these metal bands. And you start listening to what they say and, and it, it just started sucking me in. I liked that look. I like leather. I like studs and spikes. I like fire. So everything that I was watching and listening to, you know, I can look at this shout out to devil now and it just kind of makes me giggle. Because that is nothing compared to what the enemy's doing nowadays. It is absolutely, I told Josh, I said, I have changed this testimony or these videos about 12 times. Because I would, I would start doing this stuff, and I'd be like, oh, they can't see that. Y'all would literally throw up in here. I'd be like, well, I can't show them that. I can't show them a Cannibal Corpse video. I can't show them a Venom video. I can't show them a Slayer video. Because in the metal world today, they are actually doing satanic rituals on stage. That is a long way from when I grew up, guys. He started conditioning me with imagery and with lyrics, okay? If you'll go back to the earliest times of Motley Crue, they always wore a pentagram right on their forehead. Tommy's lead drum set had a pentagram on the front of his drum set, okay? They start slowly bringing into you this satanic imagery until where you accept that. Oh, that's cool. I can remember my mom telling me, John, that's the devil. No, mom, that's cool, okay? So you start... You start molding yourself around what you see because words bring life or death, right? And so when you start listening to this music, you start bringing in this negativity into your life. And then it happened. The song that changed everything. That is actually not, that's mild. Guys, that group is called WASP, and WASP stood for We Are Sexual Perverts. Uh, from the very night, I don't remember if y'all can remember back in the 80s, they had a thing called Headbangers Ball. And I can remember laying in my bed with headphones on, and that actually wasn't the right song, but we're going to give Andrew the benefit of the doubt, because he is awesome. Uh, I'll let him play it in just a second. The song was called I Want to Be Somebody. And listening to that song in my bed, the hair on my back stood straight up. And you can actually feel the presence of evil. And it just enticed me to the point where the next day, back then, we had what's called record players. <laughs> I went and bought every wasp. They only had two, but I went and bought every wasp uh, record that they made. And guys, I literally sat there and memorized every song to every, or every word to every song that was played. I loved everything about them. Blackie Lawless was, to me, a god. He wore saw blades. He wore a 12-inch saw blade between his legs. He wore spikes. All of his songs were about sex or Satan. That song that you just... You just uh, witnessed was called Hellion. Uh, 
I was blessed to be a part of Hell Houses up here, and I would always, my room would always be my testimony. I always had a heavy metal room, and that was my testimony. I actually played that song in one of the uh, rooms that we did. So the worship began, guys. Couldn't get enough. You start memorizing. Once you start pumping your mind full of all this, it's word after word. One of the statements in that song, uh, I, and, and listen to that, just, just flood your minds with memories. Uh, when you get to the middle of that song, it says, The gods you worship are still. At the altar of rock and roll, you'll kneel. A slave who forever rocks is chained in the devil's locks and slain by the bloody axe that I wail. And you start with that imagery, and I made my room, Wasp had a thing called the rack. It was a big rack with spikes, and they would tie a naked lady up to it in a concert and slit her throat. I built this in my room. I thought it was cool, okay? I built a huge pentagram, well a pentagram, and put it at the foot of my bed. Because all this imagery to me was metal, okay? That was a lifestyle. That started resonating with me. I'm like, oh, this is cool, man. All right, so you start going to school. One of the things that happened in school, and this was a freak, I was in ag class, sitting upstairs, and everybody knew I was a metalhead. And I was sitting there, and I happened to look over, and I saw the wind catch the door, and the door was finished shut. And so I stood up, and I said, in the name of Satan, shut. And the door slammed shut. And buddy, from that moment on in high school, I had a reputation of the man. People would get out of your way when you walk down the hallways. People were just like, oh, man, John is this, John is that. So you gained a type of respect. It was a weird kind of respect. But you gained it. You gained a reputation in school. In the 10th grade, I met whew, my first wife. <laughs> you know, when you're a Satanist, what do you expect Satan to bring you, right? So he introduced me, and I'm going to name you names. He introduced me to my first wife. We started dating. She was not a good girl. And so I was introduced to sex. I was introduced to, and by the way, she was Catholic. So if anybody's in here Catholic, we'll talk later. <laughs> because I would, people laugh at me at work. There's supposed to be some guys at work come. She was Catholic, so I'd actually go to a service with her. And when we would go in, I would try to boil the holy water. You know, they do the, I would try to boil it. I would sit there, and the priest would be on stage, and I would sit there and try to put curses on him as he was talking. So I met my first wife. Then I was introduced, guys, to pain. Okay? And this is mostly for the teenagers. Uh, I started dating, started dating her. We weren't living for Christ. We were living for evil. And then the unthinkable happens. At 15 years old, she comes to me and she says those words that haunt me for eternity. She says, I'm pregnant. Okay, 15 years old. So you sit here and you think, what am I going to do? I can't have a baby at 15 years old, right? And so you start hearing these voices that you've been hearing because you've, you've, you've possessed your mind with evil. And so the voice just says, get rid of it, right? I mean, isn't that the logical thing to do? That's what society tells you to do. So at 15 years old, I came up with the money and I killed my baby. Now then... What the homeboy doesn't tell you is when you're worshiping him is how much pain comes for certain decisions that you make, okay? And so you take that pain and you just shove it down and you shove it down and you shove it down and you shove it down. And what he does is he uses these things to bring you closer to him because one thing that he promised me is he said, I can take the pain away from you. He said, I can take the pain. I was having a very bad relationship with her. 
Uh, she played mind games. I imagine some of y'all had that experience before. You just constantly are beaten down, beaten down, beaten down, and the only thing that could take the pain was going deeper and deeper and deeper into the heavy metal. Once you, once you get to that level, guys, you begin giving him everything. And yes, I'm old. I have to write this stuff down. As my life spiraled out of control, I met, we got a divorce. Uh, I met my second wife. I thought, hey, you know, this is it. This is pretty cool. I had two awesome girls. I've got Tommy and Brittany back here. Those are my little girls. I'm like, hey, there's actually a life that's normal. And so we tried to make it work, and you try to push all that aside. And, and every time something bad happens, it comes right back up, and you go right back and go. I could go right back to that song, Hellion. And it would literally put you in a trance. It would, it would just make you numb where nothing mattered. The pain would, would go away for a little while. As I met her, we were married for almost 11 years. And then we separated. And I'll never forget trying to make everything work. And you get these papers handed to you where it says... You can only see your kids on this weekend, and you can only see your kids on this Wednesday. And my life just crashed. Literally just spiraled out of control. It was a pain that I had never in my life felt before because losing one kid was always in the back of your head, and now you felt like you've lost the other two kids because of a piece of paper, because of bad decisions that you made. And so I went right back to what I knew would take the pain away. Met another girl, and I do not mean this in disrespect, but that relationship was like a blur. I can look back, we lived together for about a year, and I can't remember half of it. It's just an absolute blur in my life. Well, I guess I didn't do, uh, I don't guess I did what he wanted me to do because you hear these voices and it was, you're not worthy. It's, it's just going through Hell House, you know, guys, people that have gone through this stuff, I've had people tell me, man, they should have named that, you know, so-and-so Hell Life. And you can go through here, and I can sit there, and I could watch the demons play. And it's awful funny, isn't it? Everybody wants to be demons. Have you noticed that in the church? Everybody wants to be a demon. Everybody wants to be the bad guy. Y'all supposed to giggle with that. <laughs> but you hear these voices... And it was, you're not worthy. Look what you did. La, 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 la. It's like you're walking through Hell House. You hear all these voices in the back of your head. And I couldn't handle it anymore. Everybody has a breaking point. And I guess I had reached my breaking point, and I'll never forget this. I was sitting in my living room. I went to the drawer. I got a 1911 Colt out. Chambered around. I stick it in my mouth, and I start pulling the trigger. Because you're like, I cannot handle this pain anymore. And as I'm squeezing the trigger, this, in my, I told Josh, I said, I've heard a, a voice in my head three times in my life that I know was God. And this voice was like somebody standing right behind me, and he says, are you ready to listen to me now? And it was like somebody was in the room with me, and I pulled the gun out of my mouth, and I turned around, and I said, what? And says, are you ready to listen to me now? And I happen to look up on the mantel. I had a fireplace. And I look up on the mantel. And I see a picture of Tommy and Brittany. 
and this overwhelming peace just fell completely over me. And I said, yes, I am. And at that moment, I gave my life to Christ. You know, what do you do? I grew up in a church. Right? Like I told you before, my mom was secretary at Redland Baptist Church. Church did nothing for me. You, you, you just go to church, see your friends, and you go home, right? And so I didn't know what church was supposed to be like, so I gave my life to Christ. I was like, oh, my gosh, I like heavy metal. What am I going to do? I can't listen to this stuff anymore. So I go to Christian Word. Here it comes. I go to Christian Words and Works, <laughs> and I meet Wes. Y'all know who Wes is, right? Everybody give it up for Wes. I walk into Christian Words and Works, and Wes takes, I never met him before in my life. He takes one look at me, and he says, you like 80s heavy metal. I say, yeah. He said, let me show you some Christian heavy metal. And Wes took me over there, and he started playing all this Christian metal for him. And I'm like, holy cow. You know why there's Christian heavy metal, guys? Because God becomes everything to everybody so that by any means necessary, some will come to Christ. Okay? I uh, got my life back on track, right? I started praying. I started going to church. The church was struggling. Uh, I just, I dove in to everything I could. I'll never forget it. I had a mullet. <laughs> Standing about right here. Yeah, I rocked the mullet for a long time. <laughs> High top shoes. I drove a 78 T-top gold Trans Am. I drive up to the church one day, and a kid comes out there, and he says, Mr. John, you are cool. <laughs> and I said, ding. I went straight to the pastor, Brother Ty. I said, I don't know why I'm supposed to tell you this. I said, but I want to work with the youth. He said, do you think you can win souls? I said, I'll do everything I can. He said, do it. And Fear Factor Youth Ministry was born. I was a youth pastor at Redland Baptist Church doing a Fear Factor youth ministry when Josh Pogue was youth pastor up here, and they actually came to a couple of my Fear Factors that we did. Guys, I dove in, okay? Uh, back then, we had just the piano and the organ and so forth, and I just kept feeling led to, to, to do something like y'all had, but we didn't have anything. I said, all right. I said, God... I said, show you how bad I want. I said, I'm going to learn how to play the drums. And so I went and bought a CD. I went to a garage sale, bought a $100 used drum set, and I practiced for six hours every day until it clicked. I said, all right, Lord. I said, I got a drummer. We prayed and we prayed, and about two years went by. And I'll never forget, I come out of Sunday because I was teaching Sunday school. I had youth. I come downstairs, and Brother Ty walked up to me, and he said, John, here's Chuck Hainer. He's a singer and lead guitarist. This is his son. He plays the bass. He said, you got a praise band. <laughs> Just like that. And guys, we dove in, and we dove in, and I tried everything I could do. I was so pumped. I was serving the true king. Right? Until the church. I have never in my life met a group of people that were so selfish. My way or get out. How dare you wear sleeveless shirts in this church? You walked too fast down the aisle. You said that word on stage? Guys, it was an absolute nightmare. I wasn't fighting Satan anymore, guys. I was fighting the church. Do you hear what I'm saying? I was fighting the people that I was trying to help. 
and I was, I was stopped at every corner. It got to the point to where I would be sick at my stomach when I was getting ready to go to church. And then it become a battle. I'm like, all right, we're going to go to war, sister. I had one on one time come up to me and say, John, how dare you wear that to church? I said, what am I wearing? I had blue jeans and a sleeveless shirt. How dare you wear that to church? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. So the next Sunday, I wore sandals and a robe. <laughs> I said, this is what my king wore. Is that good enough for you? Okay. Guys, it became, it became a... It was sickening because it became a challenge. Every time they would come to me and be like, you can't do that. Oh, brother, I kicked it in high gear. <laughs> I talked to Brother Ty. We had what we call youth day. I had the entire service the last Sunday of every month. I had people getting up and walking out of the church. I was the first person to ever play drums in that church. That was a no-no. So what did I do? I did drum solo. I have a warning. <laughs> Be careful, Christians, of how you treat new Christians. Okay? This is coming from experience. We have done more damage to society than Satan ever will. I have seen more people come to the church because of something that we would try to do to become all things to all people. And we would get people in the church and the Christians would run them out. So be careful what you say, what you do, because people are watching you. I had an interesting conversation one time with a Mormon. Yeah, that was interesting. i never forget he brought... He came, uh, I'm supervisor in the truck shop at Brooks Brothers, and he brought the oil that we had. And he come in one day, <laughs> just to griping. Have you seen these people going to church lately? I said, what? They're wearing flip-flops and shorts in God's house. I said, what am I supposed to wear? I said, from the Bible that I read, Jesus lives in me. I said, you're going to a building, brother. I said, Jesus sees you naked, so he don't care if you've got a three-piece suit on. <laughs> okay? But that was, the, that was the mindset of a lot of churches. It was more tradition. And I'm not, I'm not dogging anything. I'm just saying, guys, when somebody, I used to, I used to get so mad. I would stand on stage and tell the congregation, I said, I'm going to tell you all this. If God starts it, brother, there ain't nothing you can do to stop it. Okay? And it got to the point to where we had to leave. And we prayed about it, and we prayed about it. And another church happened to need a pastor, a youth pastor, and a praise and worship team. Can you believe that? So at one Goodbye, y'all. We go to another church, and we start everything again. I said, all right, we're going to do something different. So I started a youth ministry called Rebellion. Now, what was interesting, you know, I'm ready for war, but this church had a whole different attitude toward young people. I had an 85-year-old woman come up to me at Crossroad and say, I just love listening to your drums. Wow. Wow. What a difference from being get, getting up and people walking out on you when you hit that first tom to, to a woman saying, that was so cool that you're bringing these young people up here and they're worshiping Christ. So it's a mindset, guys. Uh, you get so wrapped up in the church, you want to do everything that you can and I burned myself out. And that's very easy to do. Uh, especially in a small church. 
I was doing everything. You teach Sunday school, you teach a Wednesday night, you teach. Guy, and this is sad. We had a lot of people leaving at Crossroads, so I started like my own little church upstairs. Because a lot of the young people were leaving. And I said, okay. I said, we got to do something. So it just becomes overwhelming. And so you start getting burned out. Guys, there is an evil that unless you have experienced it, your mind cannot comprehend. I used to tell my kids all the time, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, you're up against somebody that hates you with a passion. Hates you, hates your siblings, hates everything about you, and his number one goal is to destroy your life. And he will do it by any means possible. He will use your family. He will use your job. He will use friends. He will use kids. He will use church people. He will use pastors. He will use anything he can get his hands on to destroy you. You are up against somebody, guys, that never sleeps. He never eats. He never stops coming for you, period. Do you understand this? I get so tickled at people thinking, well, I'm okay. No, 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 you're not okay, brother. You're going up against somebody that in the presence of God Almighty convinced a third of the angels who were in heaven with God that he was better than God. And you think you got a chance in hell? The only way that you have that you can fight him is with the word of God, period. I get so sick of people, and this, I tell Josh all the time, I say, if you need somebody to talk to, I got an ear because I got so sick of people. I get so sick of people's attitude. Well, God will understand. No, God don't have to understand, Okay? God doesn't have to understand anything. God doesn't need you. You need God. God says, I'll call the rocks to worship me. I don't need you. And people have this, well, I just don't believe in the Bible. No, ma'am, you don't believe in the Bible because if you believe in the Bible, that means you're accountable. All right? They did an experiment, and I laughed. They did an experiment one time. They put people in an elevator. And as the elevator was going down, the lights would go off. And when the lights come back on, there'd be a little demon kid standing in the corner. Just standing there. Of course, you see these people's reaction. 99.9% of everybody in this room did this. If I don't see it, it doesn't exist, right? If I don't believe it, then it can't exist, right? Guys, you can say that wall is pink all you want to. I love Josh's last sermon. You know, if you're a dude and you want to be a girl, that's up to you, but you're still a dude. <laughs> I have tried to self-identify as a 65-year-old man so I can retire, but that's not going over real well with people. <laughs> I don't know why everybody else can do it and why somebody would want to go from a man to a woman is beyond me. (laughs) Guys, once I got my life straight, I wrote a letter to God. People think it's retarded. I wrote a letter to God. I said, dear God, this is what I want in a woman. I want her like this, 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 and this. I laid on my bed and I prayed over it. I said, if you want me to be with somebody, you bring her to me. And I'm through looking. I've had four and I'll turn to poop. (laughs) I said, you bring her to me. And until that day, I said, I will serve you with everything I have. 
and I will do everything I can to bring somebody to Christ. Eight years later, I get a phone call from Jennifer. He said, hey, she, you know, she was coming up here, which I didn't hold that against her. <laughs> she said, hey, we were having ice cream up here tonight. She said, won't you ride your bike up here? She said, you can take me for a ride. I said, Jennifer, if I take you for a ride on my motorcycle, I said, you will fall in love with me. <laughs> We've been married nine years. Best thing ever happened to her. <laughs> Kids, what you do, I promise you. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. I used to get so mad at my youth group, I would tell them, do I need to summon the demon? If you see what is it going to take for me to get through to you that there is a spiritual war out there? Everything that you do in your life, everything you listen to, everything you watch, everything you say opens doors. Okay? And when that door is opened, you have invited an unclean spirit into, what is that? Is that an eyeball? <laughs> you have invited an unclean spirit into your life. Once that unclean spirit attaches itself to you, it's hard to get rid of it. Okay? You know, the Bible talks about that one goes away and it says, I'll wait for the stronger one to come back. I was telling Josh the other day when, when Andrew was making this video for me. Guys, I would sit in a pentagram. Everybody know what a pentagram is? A pentagram is the shape of a goat head. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Satan is the goat. Okay? Satan wants to be everything like Jesus. Just like that concert I showed you. Satan wants to be worshipped. That's his ultimate goal is to be worshipped. People look at me and be like, dude, you worship Satan? I said, dude, so did you. What? I said, when did you become a Christian? Oh, about a year ago. I said, guess what, brother? Guess who you worshipped until you gave your life to Christ? The only difference is, is I knew who I was worshipping. I called out to his name. I would sit in a pentagram in my room saying the Lord's Prayer backwards because that's what Satanists do. Playing that song, it would go into another realm just to ease the pain. And one day, I got to thinking, why was I never possessed? I believe in possession, guys. You can't tell me when I owed all these shootings and stuff. When people go in and shoot places, and then Satan removes himself from them. They realize what they did, so they shoot themselves because of the guilt. I 100% believe in possession. And I always wonder, I said, why was I never possessed? I never killed anybody. I killed an unborn. I said, why wasn't I possessed? Guys, it was about four to five years after I gave my life to Christ. And I did a skit on this at Crossroad one time. I gave my first testimony. And my mom came up to me, who was an absolute devout Christian woman. She said, you didn't know I used to pray for you, did you? I said, what? Guys, my room was the epitome of evil. I had the rack. I had pentagrams. I had ceiling, walls covered in wasp and satanic imagery. And I would sit in that pentagram and just pray, if you'll take the pain, I am yours. I will serve you. I will hunt down every Christian on this face of the earth and will destroy him with everything I got. 
You know what surprised me? Is Christians don't know that much. That's actually sad. Christians do not know why they serve the God that they serve. I would go at Redland Baptist Church and ask people, why do you go to church on Sunday? Why do you do what you do? I I remember in high school going to these Christian kids. I could destroy you. I knew more about the Bible than the Christians did. But my mom came to me. Guys, and this, this blowed my mind. This is the power of prayer. I would be in my room in a pentagram praying to Satan. And my mom said, she said, every time I heard that song, come on in your room. She said, I would walk to your door, kneel down, and pray over you. Can you imagine the battle going on in my room? Man. I'm sitting there giving Satan absolute authority to take me over. My mom is saying, no, you can't. And I just, I would sit there at night sometimes, and when I go to heaven, that's the first thing I'm going to ask Jesus is, can I see that day? Can I see one of those days in my room in the spiritual warfare that was going on? It would probably be like a kung fu movie. (laughs) It would be absolutely amazing. Guys, you don't have to worship Satan. You don't have to be a heavy metal. You don't have to be a Satanist. You don't have to be on drugs. You, you've never heard that in my testimony. I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't a drug. Yeah, I drank, got drunk. I smoked weed like cigarettes. But that's not what it was about. It was about power. It was about seeing something that took the pain away and you latched on to it. You don't have to do all that. All he has to do is keep you away from the Word of God. That's it. And he's doing a very good job of it. Satanism is one of the fastest growing religions out there other than witchcraft. And the Satanic Church, or the Church of Satan, started by Anton LaVey, We'll tell you, we don't worship Satan. We worship the idea and the freedom of Satan. Okay, that's why you have rituals. What do you summon, an idea? <laughs> but, but wouldn't that be a little bit odd, though, if the church of Satan come out and said, we worship Lucifer? Everybody be like, oh, my gosh, but if you tell somebody, I worship an idea, that makes it, that downplays it a little bit. Guys, you have got to understand who you serve. I struggle every day living that life for 15 years. I have a anger issue. I still struggle with anger. As my family. I struggle with pride. And that's what I was talking about in the church. Even in the church. He uses people against you. He uses you. I got very prideful at being a youth minister, at being able to do all this stuff, okay? We did the first seven years of Hell House up here. They called me and Jennifer back. I screwed that up royally because of pride. How dare you tell me how to do this? And it took a year for God to humble me to the point where he's like, they don't need you. And so I came back. I apologize to everybody. I apologize to Josh. <laughs> Be careful of what you do, guys. There is a war that you cannot imagine. And it's just going to get worse. And worse and worse. So study the Word of God. Okay? That is the only weapon you have, is the Word of God. The Word of God is alive and active, sharp than any double edged sword. Okay? 
Mr. Josh, I'm going to end with this. I don't do the altar calls. People just don't like coming up to me for some reason. <laughs> I have something to fight for. That's my kids, my wife, and my grandbabies. And I will fight with everything I have. The church let me down at one time in my life. I'm expecting you not to. When you see new people come in, show them who Christ is. Don't show them who you are. Show them who Christ is. Thank you. Hey, would you stay standing? I want to invite our, our uh, worship team to come and join me on the stage real quick. Yo, I want to, I want to recap a couple of things because I, I felt like there was really two big pieces in his message that, um, that we need to think about, that we need to pray about, that we need to search ourselves for. The first one is this. Be careful who you worship. Be careful who you serve. Know who you are. That whole thought process. Listen. Your music that you listen to, the things that you watch, the things that you read, the things that you allow to come into your mind, a lot of times God will bring a message like this so that we can clear out things in our life, so that we can evaluate our life and get rid of things in our life that we know that the Holy Spirit's been dealing with that we need to get rid of and they need to go. For some of you, that might be your music. For some of you, you need to shut down your Facebook. For some of you, that's Netflix. Whatever that looks like. If you don't have enough self-control to get the things out of your life that, that, that God is asking you to get out of your life, then you just may need to shut something completely down. But I believe the two pieces that, that, that God is, is, is shooting at us, is hitting at us through John's testimony is, number one, you need to know who you serve and why you serve them. And then stop yourself from serving someone without you even knowing that you're serving them through allowing junk in your life. I believe today that we need to release some things and give them to God. And then the second thing is this. This is to the church. <laughs> Don't be you, be me. I thought that was so good. God is bringing people into our church for us to love and for us to show the way and for us to be Jesus too. And if we don't do that, we are failing him. That's huge, y'all. So I think that maybe, maybe we need to repent. I think maybe we need to repent. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Satan's trying to infiltrate the church, y'all. I'm just kidding. Altar team, would you come and come up to the front? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song. If you're here today, if you're here today and you know that there are things in your life that you need to give up, then I'm going to ask you, would you be obedient to the Holy Spirit? And would you come and either get the, pray that you, the prayer that you need or come and find a place where you can gain the strength that you need by your alone time with God and ask him to help you as he is calling you to give these specific things up? The second piece is, if you're here and you need to repent, because you've been too religious or because you've been too full of yourself or because you got pride issues and you've allowed your pride to hurt people. Then I want to invite you to in just a minute, don't hold that in. Get rid of it. You'll feel so much better. Get rid of it. Repent before God. So with every head bowed and every head closed, if you need to get something out of your life, if you need to repent and ask God to help you to be Him, or if you need prayer for anything, in here today if the holy spirit's dealing with you if he's drawing you if he's pulling you right now as we sing this song would you step out and come come find someone to pray with you they would love to or come and find a place where you can pray with god where you can go to god and allow him to do a new work in you come on right now and if you want to step out and come to the front and worship would you step out and come right now to the front let's worship the lord and let's allow god to do a supernatural work inside of us today